Good people greet you with a smile and a shame. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> now, somebody asked me, why don't we get comfortable chairs in here? You know, these things are kind of hard. Well, I did that for a reason. Actually, two reasons. One is that they're multi-purpose here. You can come back in here and eat, and you can spill stuff on that chair, and we can wipe it down. Yeah? The second thing is, if you get too comfortable, I know you, you'll go to sleep. No sleeping, all right? No sleeping. So uh, I appreciate it. We are studying the book of Daniel. If this is your first time here, this is an interesting book, isn't it? Amen? Uh, I tell you what, and I said last week that I needed to divide it up into two portions because uh, uh, we're in Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 2 is full of all kinds of good stuff. But it's full of so much stuff that we had to divide it into two parts. A character building part and a prophecy part. How many of you were here last week? <laughs> well, that kind of explains the attendance then, doesn't it? Amen? <laughs> no. I know everybody's got vacations. This is probably an interesting book to be preaching on in the summertime. Because uh, there are people that are in and out a lot on vacation. I get that. But we're going to keep plugging through it anyway. Daniel chapter 2. I, I just want to tell you that I, uh, I visited with the uh, elders of our church the other day. We decided to put something in the, the restrooms. You, you know, have you ever seen those uh, blow dryers, those sanitary blow dryers for your hands? Well, I've got to be honest with you. I'm going to take them out. And the reason I'm going to take them out is because I went into the restroom a little while ago between uh, practicing and the service, and there was a sign on right underneath one of those sanitary blow dryers. It said, for a copy of today's sermon, press here. <laughs> just hurt my feelings. I'm telling you all, it just hurt my feelings. Something awful. I know. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Some of you have a little sympathy for the preacher. Some of you don't. Hey, I'm only serious, right? Yeah, good. All right. We're in a series called Things Are Not Always As They Appear. And they're not always as they appear, are they? I, I tell you what, you can, you can turn on the TV. You can go, you can walk out of your, your front yard, and you can see that what appears to be normal has become extremely abnormal. Hasn't it? Amen? I'll tell you what, the Bible talks about this. How many of you believe that the book of Revelation is a prophetic scripture given to us by God to outline the end times? Wow. Amen? Okay. If you don't, you will by today, I hope. Okay? Now, I'm not preaching on the book of Revelation, but I do want to tell you that what we're talking about this morning is going to set up that book. If you don't believe that book, you may have a little bit of a hard time today. Okay, but I hope that we can kind of clear your mind about some of this. I do also want to say real quickly that uh, lots of times, uh, if you've come to Cowboy Church before, lots of times we come in here, we have a big time, we have a lot of fun, we believe in, and uh, I tell you what, praising God, and we do that by clapping, saying amen, and we'll even laugh on occasion around here, amen? Because we believe that, that worshiping God ought to be a joyous thing. This series right here, it, it, you know, for all practical purposes, may have taken some of the laughter out of Scripture because it's not it's something that is very serious. And uh, I think it's time to preach on this with you guys. Um, you know, I, I don't always preach real deep stuff, but I think that we have grown as a church body and spiritually grown enough that we need to hear some tough stuff. Amen? Yeah, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Pay close attention today. Um, if you can, please do that. If you need to stretch for a moment, you can stretch for a moment. But I don't want you to lose your place in this. Otherwise, your life will be confused when we get done today. Okay? Can you do that? Amen? Yeah. All right, good. Last week or two weeks ago, we talked about the word what? Anybody remember? Resolve. Resolve. Very good. Somebody was listening. Steve, thank you, bud. Appreciate that. You're on my Christmas card list, buddy. Uh yeah, we did. We talked about resolve. Remember, we had a little carpet cleaner thing out. And, you, and we said, you know what, we got to resolve to be more like Christ. Amen? Now, I'm going to tell you something real quickly. Go back and talk about this for a second. If you don't resolve to do that, you're going to have a very difficult time with what is fixing to happen in the book of Daniel. Amen? Amen? Because if you've not resolved yourself to be like Christ, 
that when the prophetic time, when, the, when all this comes to, to, to happen, uh, the book of Revelation comes to happen, you're going to have a very difficult time in being Christ-like or God-like or being the cho one of the chosen people if you can't come to grips with resolving to walk today like Christ. Amen? Okay, good. Now, I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe it's never been more important for you and I as believers in Jesus Christ. And if you're not a believer today, let me just tell you, that's okay. That's all right. You just sit back, you relax. I'm not going to poke fingers at you or push fingers at you or anything like that. I just want you to relax and I want you to absorb what we're talking about today. Okay? Then I'll give you something to think about when we get done. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there is a standard of living that goes along with that. Amen? I'll tell you what, and that standard is, if we don't live that standard, how in the world are people around us even going to begin to understand what Christ is like, much less Christ is coming back? Amen? Amen? Now, maybe I should ask that question. Do you believe Christ is coming back? Yes. All right, now, uh, good, that's about half of us. <laughs> that's all right, because my question by the end of the day is, where are the other half of you going to be? Okay? I want you to think about that. That's all right. Because it's a good question to ask. I'd rather ask it now than ask it after Christ has come back, though. Amen? Amen. Good. All right. Last week I told you that Daniel chapter 2 was, again, full of so much stuff. And we're going to start with verse 24. Now, I know the guys have got all the scripture up here, and I'm fixing to throw them for a loop. Okay? You're, Adam, I'm fixing to throw you for a loop. I'm going to tell you about all the scripture from 24 to 49, I think is what it is today, but we're not going to read all that, okay? Because I think you'll pass out and you'll check out before I get done with reading the scripture today, okay? And I don't want you to do that, so I'm going to ask if you'll stand. We're going to start with verse 36, all right? Verse 36 is where we're going to start in Daniel chapter 2. If you have your Bible, if you would turn with us, I'd appreciate that. I want to encourage you to bring your Bible with you. Uh, it's great to look up on the screen. These guys do an awesome job. But here's the reason I want you to bring the Word. Because when you sit down, there are some things in your Bible I want you to mark and remember. Okay? Now, we're not going to let you mark it up here on our screen. All right? We kind of like it the way it is. But you can mark it in your Word. So let me encourage you to bring your Bible with you if you would. Starting with verse 36, this was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it. Even as you saw iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate, prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of, of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Now verse 48. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler of the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father, thank you again, Father, for this time today, Father. And this is difficult information. It's tough information. But, Father, I just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our spirits today to discover what it is that you want us to know out of this second part of Daniel. Father, I believe that you are coming back. I believe that you are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. And I believe, Father, that it doesn't matter who seems to be in charge in this world today, Father. You are going to rule and you are going to reign. And, Father, today we just offer up our hope, our encouragement, and our spirit to you as we study prophecy this morning. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I heard of the word apocalyptic yeah you know every time I've ever heard that word that word kind of rings out with something that just kind of scares the you know what out of me amen and you know and I think it's supposed to because the word apocalyptic means it's a revelation of secrets the dictionary defines apocalyptic material as pertaining to the book of revelation or predicting disaster and total universal destruction Amen. Amen. Now, that's all well and good. Except if when you have to live in the middle of it, right? Amen? Yeah. Um, we know it's coming. The book of Revelation has already told us that, that the end times are going to be much different than they were or have been in the past. Um, many have tried to predict the end of the world. I don't know about you, but it, it wasn't that long ago. When we, I think we even had a preacher trying to predict the end of the world, didn't we? You know, and they, and they came out and they said, oh, well, it's going to be 2012. Y'all remember 2012? Yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody was just so sure that 2012 was the year that everything was just going to come to an end. And the reason they thought this is because many scientists, many people that were a lot more brilliant than I am, had come up with this idea that the Mayan calendar was coming to an end, right? Y'all remember that? Yeah, and, and a lot of scientists were buying into this mind calendar philosophy and saying, you know what, based on what we see climatically, uh, income-wise, financially, uh, the difference between, the, the, the growing differences between the rich and the poor, um, earthquakes, famine, stuff like that, we believe as scientists that if we don't change something, that in 100 years, the world will cease to exist the way it is right now. Y'all remember hearing that? Okay. If you didn't, trust me, they did. One Harvard guy personally said, and I'm, I'm going to find my notes so I can make sure that I can read this the way he wrote it. Could our society actually be headed for collapse? According to many of the world's top scientists, the answer is yes. Unless we take immediate action, scientists say that extreme climate changes coupled with famine, disease, spreading of a gap between rich and the poor have the potential to produce a post-apocalyptic world in less than 100 years. And this Harvard University professor stated, we cannot continue going down the same path. If we continue to do business as usual, we will see more floods, more droughts, more heat waves, more wildfires, more ice melting, more rising sea levels. As scientists, we believe that this can and will occur. Now, I tell you what, these are, these are supposed to be the brightest of the bright. Amen? Now, as scientists, they don't have a whole lot of hope, do they? Isn't it a shame? Because see, I tell you, and the thing about it is, you and I both know, you and I both know, that things have to occur the way God has put them in order to occur before He comes back. Amen? And I tell you what, you and I have little or no control over that at all. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter to me what we do, what we don't do. Uh, whether it comes to exhaust or whatever. The course of events are going to happen whether you and I try to intervene with that or not. Amen? And this is something you and I both need to understand. We need to understand that this is what's going to happen. It's not only been prophesied and predicted in the book of Revelation, but even the book of Daniel talks about this. Amen? Okay. Are you good with all right. Everybody good? You awake? Do I need to scream? Do I need to jump up and down? Do the bobby dance or something like that? All right. Good. All right. All 
I tell you what, I am so glad that I've read the last chapter of, of the Bible. Boy, am I glad. Because if I hadn't read the book of Revelation, at least gone over the book of Revelation, this right here would be enough to bother me uncontrollably. As a matter of fact, I think I would probably be looking for a new place to hide. I don't know. The Bible even talks about that. There will be people hiding under rocks, which you won't be able to escape. But I still think that many are worried about this. They're building up food supplies. They're, they're figuring out, what are we going to do in some kind of apocalyptic event? Well, there's got to be some place we can go. There's got to be some place we can get away from it. And I want to tell you, folks, that the only place that you're going to be able to escape what's going on now is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. Amen? That's it. Turn, if you've got your Bible in front of you, I didn't ask the guys to put this up here, so I'm going to make you look this one up. John chapter 14, verse 29. John chapter 14, verse 29. And I'm going to move quickly because I've got a little bit to cover here. So you look that up and then mark it. I have told you now before it happens. So that when it does happen, you will believe. I have told you this before it happens. Now, I, I agree that I think a lot of our uh, stuff that's going on in this world today is setting the platform for the second coming of Christ. I, I've thought that for a good little while now. I personally have no idea when that's going to be. Okay? Neither does any other preacher. Neither does any other theologian. Neither does any other scientist. Okay? Let's be clear about that. But the Bible does give us some description of some things that says, you know what, this is going to begin to occur before Christ comes back. And I'm not a dummy, you're not a dummy. We got eyes, we got a brain, and we got ears, and we can see, and we can hear. And I got to tell you, because I think you'd agree with me, a lot of this stuff is going on now. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So it's not hard to see that. But God has already said in His Word, I told you before it happens. There's a reason I told you this. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. I just want you to know this is what's coming. It's coming, folks. So I've told you so that when it does happen, you'll believe. Believe what? Believe what? Yeah, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Predictive prophecy always points. And I want you to write this down on your handout. Okay? Because I know a lot of you have, have, have studied prophecy, you looked at prophecy, a lot of you have questions about prophecy. Um, a lot of people have gotten it more wrong than right. Amen. Just the way it is. But I want to tell you something. Look at this, write it down. Predictive prophecy, like Daniel, always, and capitalize the word always, always points towards Jesus Christ. Amen. It always does. Okay? If it points towards anything else other than him, it is incorrect. Listen to me. If it points to anything other than Christ, you need to run, shut the book, quit reading, quit listening. It's wrong. Okay. All right, good. So we're all on the same page. Good. So as we discuss Daniel chapter 2 and the prophecy in this book, I'm praying that this scripture will build your faith. But I'm also praying that the scripture will point you to the Savior. Amen. Amen? Amen? All right, good. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Look at this one. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. This is extremely important for our topic today. All right? We talked about this in Bible study a little bit the other day. Which, by the way, while you're looking that up, let me reemphasize one thing. We talk about this stuff in great detail in Bible study on Wednesday night at 6.30. All right? I just want you to know that. If you are walking out of here scratching your head going, I don't get it, that's fine. Come Wednesday night, we'll talk about it. Amen? Okay, good. Because there's a lot of details I, I don't have. Uh, you know, the elders only give me so long to preach here, so I have to kind of hurry. All right? So, but Wednesday night, i got all the time in the world. Amen? So uh, we all, we, we talk, I'm just kidding, they don't really do that. But, uh, well, some of them do. But uh, anyway, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Let's look at this. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, and this is what I want you to underline, 
Let the reader understand. Okay? Now, here's what this means. This is Jesus talking. You need to understand this. Jesus is saying, when you see this, when you read about Daniel, when you read about the prophecy of Daniel, I want you to understand something. This guy is for real. He's pointing towards me. What he says is true. You can take it and you can bank on it. That's what it's saying right here, all right? He's referencing Daniel. He's saying, yeah, I know. Daniel said that. We gave him the authority to say that. And it's true. You need to believe that. Now, I'm going to tell you, before we get into this prophecy this morning, this is what you and I need to understand. That's a pretty doggone good recommendation. Right? I mean, if you were looking for some authority or if you were writing a book and you wanted somebody to, to be an authority that says, I want to recommend this book, getting Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to do that is about the best recommendation you're ever going to get. And Jesus says, Daniel is trustworthy. You can believe this. All right? Are we all good? All right. Now, given our restraints and time, I want to start one thing. Verse 26, the king asked Daniel, also called Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Now, 27 says, Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. You need to underline that a couple of times, okay? Now remember, I said this all points back to Christ, right? amen? Even Daniel, even though he didn't recognize maybe Christ, he recognized the authority in God. Now, how many times do you and I try to go do things, and when it goes really well, we want to take the credit? We want to take the credit. Oh, sure, sure. You know, and I've heard this a thousand times. I've probably even done this before. Oh, sure, we're going to give God the glory, but in deep in our heart, we really don't want to do that because we're thinking, well, I'm the one that did that. I did that. You know? Yeah, God did it through me, but me. And Daniel's saying, here, O king, you need to understand something. Right off the bat, you need to understand it is not on my authority or my knowledge or anything about me that I am fixing to tell you about this dream. You need to understand it is the King of kings, it is the Lord of lords, it is God himself who has given us the answer to the king's dream. Amen? Just like this morning. I'm not smart enough to preach on all this. I'm not, trust me, my wife will tell you, okay? But uh, I'm not smart enough to do all that, but I tell you what, I have been praying about this, I have been studying this, and I tell you what, I believe God has brought about a revelation of Daniel chapter 2 to us this morning. Amen. Amen? You believe that? Okay, if you don't, you're in the wrong church. All right? Amen. Okay. All right, good. This is an unusual dream. Nebuchadnezzar's dreamed of a metal man. Interesting, huh? You know, we thought we were the first one to have a comic book called Metal Man, but we're not. And it was composed of four metals. The head was of, of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of brass, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, I put up something here that I want you to take a look at. It should be up there, Adam. It should be a picture of this. Is it not there? Well, this is not good. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Well, anyway. You have to paint, paint this picture. I did have a picture. I thought Clinton had it up there, but maybe he forgot to put it up there. But anyway, I just want you to kind of draw, just draw a figurine. Okay? Well, why have you draw it? Draw a figurine on your paper. Kind of, just kind of looks like a, a god or whatever you want to draw your little god as. Okay? By the way, that's small g. Right? Small g, not big g. Small g. All right? And I want you to make his head of gold. And his arms um, and of silver and his belly and thighs of brass. And then what else? And his feet of iron and partly clay, right? Amen? Okay, good. Now, imagine Nebuchadnezzar, he's dreaming, he's gazing upon this image. And he's seeing this, he's thinking, why in the world 
Am I being privy of seeing something like this? And so he wakes up. We said this last week. I imagine he woke straight up in bed, a terrible sweat, going, what in the world does this mean? So he asked Daniel, Daniel, can you interpret this? The very first thing Daniel does before he says a word is he acknowledges God for who he is, and then the Bible says he went and he prayed. Amen? Y'all remember reading that? Good. Let's pray. Father, just like Daniel today, Father, we're coming to you asking you to reveal in our hearts and our minds, Father, the scripture in Daniel chapter 2. Father, we realize that we're unworthy. We realize that we do not have the knowledge to completely understand your works, especially your works that are to come. But Father, you've given us a glimpse into this today in Daniel chapter 2. So I just pray that you would speak mightily today, Father, as we look at what this means. Father, thank you. For giving us wisdom. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good. In this dream. And finally at the end of the dream. After he's gazing upon this. He sees something. He sees a giant stone. Cut from the earth. But it says it's cut from the earth. And it's not cut from man's hands. In other words man did not do this. And this giant stone comes down. And hits the base of this idol. And it crushes it. As Nebuchadnezzar is watching this dream, he sees it. Every bit of this idol comes crashing down into little bitty pieces. Now that probably would scare somebody. What does that mean? What does that mean? I don't understand that. Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't get it. Did you didn't find my picture? Okay. The prophecy and the understanding of this prophecy lays the foundation for all other prophecy in the book of Daniel. So everything else we're going to study here in the next few weeks, this lays the foundation. Hey, there it is. Voila. All right, good. Thank you. Y'all see that now? Good. All right. So y'all just leave that up. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Now, verse 36. This was the dream, and now we were interpreted as the king. Your majesty, you're the king of kings. Now, I want you to understand something. I don't believe Daniel's bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar saying, you are the authority above all authority. Okay? Don't misunderstand here. Daniel already resolved himself that he belonged to God. So what he's saying here is is that you are the authority over a kingdom. But you need to also understand that God has given you that authority. Okay? Now, I want to stop right, right here real quick and just make a comment. I don't know about you. And I may be speaking for myself, and that's okay. I speak for myself a lot. But there are some governments, and we know some, that could cause worry. There are some governments that think that they are above all and for all. They make decisions based on their own personal agendas, and and irregardless or regardless of whatever anybody in the country wants. Amen? Amen? I want you to understand something. God gave them that authority. He can also take it away. Amen? Amen? All right? So we need to be comfortable with that. We need to understand God has not lost control. He's not out of control. He's not asleep while things are going on in this world right now. He understands what's happening. And by the way, He's put this into motion so that you and I can believe that the end times are coming. Amen? Okay, good. Now, notice our figure on the screen. And I'm just going to leave that up for a minute. Notice the metals. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron and clay. Notice that they decrease in value. But they increase in strength. Huh? This is something This is going to be important here in just a minute. Nebuchadnezzar is told that he is the head of gold. Now, I tell you what, if you're, if you're giving a guy a, an interpretation of the dream, when you tell him he is the head of gold, he's like in the dream. Amen? Oh, this is good. I'm on top. You see? I'm the most precious of all the metals. And yes, I am the head. With the head comes the authority, right? Hopefully you think with your head, and hopefully your head is the authority over the rest of your body. Although sometimes I guess that's questionable, isn't it? Amen? Yeah, but most, for most of us that's the case. But the, he's liking this. He's saying, you know what, this head, it's something good. I'll tell you what, I'm on top. I am the man. Right? 
Okay, come on, y'all. Work with me. The head defines the body. So did Babylon define the rest of the kingdoms it relates to in pagan philosophy. All right? I want you to know this. It's truth. There are remnants of this pagan philosophy of Babylon that are present with us even today. Okay? Amen? Yes. Examples. Let me give you some examples. Sun worship. Idol worship. Immortality of the soul. As each of these other kingdoms can and conquered the previous kingdom, they took on the philosophies of the conquered kingdom. So here's what I want you to understand. The Babylon started this whole thing. They were the first people to start idol worship. The first ones. Now, you think, well, we, I don't worship something that looks like this. Do you worship money? That's an idol. Amen? And so we see we get that philosophy from Babylon. All right? So as Babylon got conquered, the silver part is Persia. Persia came along and conquered Babylon. All right? It became the silver in this particular idol because it's noted for its silver. Amen? All right? After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, which is the one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And this bronze one is the Greek Empire. Now, how many of you went through history class? Uh, you went through history class, and I'm trying to think what was just what it was called because there's a specific one. But you, you started studying some of this stuff about Greek, Roman, Persia. How many of you studied that stuff when you were in school? Did you ever think you'd ever need that? <laughs> me neither. <laughs> yeah, me neither. But it's interesting to study that stuff because now we understand the implication of all this. All right? So here's what I want you to get. It's not, it's not just biblically correct. It's historically correct. Amen? All right. So we see the Greek Empire. Come on. Under Alexander the Great, who conquered the world, his kingdom after his death was subdivided into four generals. Now, verse 40. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. Its iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all others. The iron kingdom is Rome. Now, let me just ask you real quickly. Do we continue to use things from the Roman kingdom? Yeah, sure we do. Okay? So everything, that, when it's conquered, they take a portion of that, they take it with them and continue to use it. They continue to use it. They continue to use it. And even today, even today, we are using things from all of these kingdoms. All right? Are we all good? Are y'all good? Okay. I know this is different for Cowboy Church. I get this. Y'all hang with me. Okay? Hang with me. It stands true to this day. Western Europe, okay, Western Europe, well, let me go back to the Rome thing. They are giving the title of the Iron Kingdom for their weapons of warfare. All right? They came up with all the iron. From here, it does say that the next kingdom will be a kingdom like all of those that came before it. The Bible, through the interpretation of Daniel, makes a stunning prediction about what is to follow after the Roman Empire. It stands true to this day. Western Europe will be divided and will never be reunited. Now, I don't know about you, but I heard something on the TV just yesterday talking about this. There are tons of people working and working and working, trying to reunite Europe. They're trying to do it under one currency. They're trying to do it under one religion. They're trying to, do, they're trying to reunite the whole thing. Now, the Bible tells us that this ain't never going to happen. Are you with me? It's never going to happen. Now, um, let's look at verse 41. Just as you saw the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. I underline that. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it. Even as you saw iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. Now just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people would be a mixture and will not remain united. 
You need to underline that. Not remain united. Any more than iron mixes with clay. Again, this holds true even today. The kingdom of Rome was divided into ten different tribes. You ready? The Germans. There were two tribes that became French. The Italians. The English. The Portuguese. And the Spanish. And there were three tribes that became extinct altogether. You with me? There's ten. All right, good. Many leaders like Napoleon and even Hitler, all right, you know you're familiar with both of those names, have tried to reunite Europe. Their intention, again, was one language, one currency, and one government. Now, here, this is interesting. I looked I look this up too. Napoleon, Napoleon said the following. Now, this is Napoleon. How many, of you are, you, how many of you know about Napoleon? You good? Okay, good. Pretty bad dude, right? All right. This was a quote from Napoleon. Napoleon was quoted after the Battle of Waterloo as saying, God Almighty has been too much for me. God Almighty has been too much for me. Imagine that. Imagine that. Here's, here's the, one of the most heathenistic, power-hungry people that even history has even ever talked about. And he says, you know what? Even in all my attempt to be the super person I wanted to be, God has been too much for me. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not a betting man, but I'm going to ask you a question. All right? Now, here comes the fun part. You can set your Bibles down for just a minute. Leave them open. Set them down. All right? I'm going to give you a story, and I'm going to ask you to participate. Okay? If you were headed for the racetrack, now by the way, I want you to understand I'm not standing in the pulpit condoning gambling. But I know some of you go to the horse track. All right? So I'm all right, all right? that's cool. All right. But I'm going to ask you a question. If you were headed for the horse track and I told you, hey, you really ought to put your money on horse number one. Horse number one just really looks good to me. I tell you, we've heard some good things about horse number one. You need to put your money on horse number one. You would probably look at me without thinking, and I'm sure you would think I'm nuts. But after you thought about that for a minute, you would think, well, you know what? I really don't know that much about running the tracks and betting on horses, so I'm just going to take his advice, and I'm going to put my money on horse number one. So horse number one comes back, sure enough. Horse number one wins. Who's excited about that? Come on. Don't lie to me now. I know. Yeah. Sure you are. You're saying, hmm. Now, I've gone from right there, I've gone from something questionable to having at least a little bit of credibility, right? Amen? Okay, good. Good, good, good. Now, you're thinking, you know, he might, he just might doubt it, but he might know something about horses. The next two times you come to me and you ask what horse to bet on, because you're thinking, well, you know what? He was right last time. Let's try him again. So you come the next two times, and I tell you, hey, you need to bet on horse number seven and number eight. And you go to the track the next two times, and sure enough, horse number seven wins that one time. Horse number eight wins the next time. How credible am I now? Yeah, you're starting to think, hmm. Now, this guy's got something going on. Apparently, he knows something I don't know. So you're thinking, now, I've got a little bit more credibility now, don't I? Amen? Now, let's suppose that I give you one more number. I say, now, go to the track, bet on horse number 10. How many of you... <laughs> How many of you are going to the bank and taking out a second mortgage or whatever you're going to do? Because you're thinking, I am betting the farm this time, buddy. I am betting the farm because he's been right four out of four times here. He's just giving me another horse. I'm going to bet everything I have, and you go there, and sure enough, I'm right. I'm right. I've given you the right horse, and you want a bunch of money. How credible am I now? Huh? Tell me. Crowd participation time. Are you trusting me? Do you think I know something about horses? Are you probably going to come talk to me the next time you're going to the horse track? Yeah. 
You are. You're going to be made. In fact, I'm going to be on speed dial, right? I mean, there's going to be a path to my office because you're not going to the horse track until you had a chance to talk to me. Now, I want you to understand something. Daniel was five for five. Daniel was five for five. Now, you just admitted. I watched your heads, even those of you who don't gamble. But I watched your heads. I watched your heads. And you're saying, if I was right five out of five times, you would think I have some credibility. Don't you think Daniel's got a little bit of credibility? He's five for five, folks. I don't know many people that are, are one for one or two for two, much less five for five. Now, Daniel says, now, old King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not done yet. There's one other thing to come. Now, my question to you today is, and I'm fixing to tell you what this is. If this guy's five for five, how likely is he to be six for six? How likely? All right, let's look at it. Verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its, its interpretation is what? Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Yeah. In other words, Daniel's telling Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, you can take what I'm saying to the bank. Not because of me, but because God has revealed this to me and to you. You can take it to the bank. This had such an impact on Nebuchadnezzar that we read in verse 46. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God, underline that for me, would you please? Surely your God, capital G. Surely your God, capital G, is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries for you were able to relieve, reveal this mystery surely your God is big G now ain't this interesting it's the same thing Napoleon realized and I think every major emperor whatever that's tried to conquer the world has come up against something that's bigger and greater than he is and Nebuchadnezzar has realized through this dream that there is somebody greater than he is. He's realized, look, I have all of this stuff at my disposal, but even all of this stuff is not as great as the God of Daniel. Amen? Amen? So I'm going to close up. Look at here. I want you to think about something. I told you I was going to give you a little end thing to close up with. You ready? I know this has been a little bit lengthy, but I appreciate you being patient with me. If God is five for five in the book of Daniel, and we all agree he is, right? Okay, you can look at it. You can look at the, the picture the, 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 we have up there. God's been five for five. Okay? How much are you willing to bet? How much are you personally willing to bet? that he may be wrong on number six. Is it worth your life? Think about it for a minute. If he's five for five, is it worth your life to assume he could be wrong about number six? It's not worth mine. It's not worth mine because I'm telling you, if a God like that can be right five for five, he's going to be right six for six. Amen. There's just no doubt about that. Amen? The only, uh, are you, uh, the only way to heaven when the six for six occurs, and it will. Book of Revelation says it's coming. Daniel says it's coming. So I want you to understand something. 
Six for six will occur. You got that? It's going to happen. The only way to heaven, and listen very closely, if you've tuned me out the whole rest of the time, I'm fine with that, but hear, hear me now, okay? And I'm going to shut down. The only way you and I are going to get to heaven and escape or be privy to what God is doing in the end times as far as being with Him when the rapture occurred is by knowing His Son, Jesus Christ. Period. End of story. There's no other name. The Bible says, given under heaven, by which a man must be saved. There's no other name. And I'm going to tell you something. If I were you, I wouldn't bet against God here. Let's pray. My question is to you, and I'm going to pray right now. My question is to you, where are you? If you believe that we are beginning to see some of the results or, or some of the signs of the end times, it, it's probably a good idea for you to get your ducks in a row now. And the only way you're going to do that is admitting that you're not the master of your own universe, God is. And the only way that we're going to be assured that we have life past this life, that we have hope past number six, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. My question is, do you have that? Do you have that? Jesus Christ went to the cross for you and for me. He took my sin, he took your sin. He said, you know what, I love you so much that I'm going to stretch out my arms. I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to take on your sin. So that you can be with me. Now, there's only going to be one question. When the end time finally gets here, and it will, there's only going to be one thing, one question, one test question. The first question is, and the only question is going to be, did you accept me as Lord and Savior? Because if the answer is no, you spend the rest of eternity separated from Him. If the answer is yes, then it's not going to matter what happens past that point because you and I are going to be with a Savior for all of eternity. Is it worth it to you to make sure? He's five for five. He's going to be six for six. Where are you going to be? Father, today we thank you so much for this time together. Father, I thank you for the scripture in Daniel. It's prophetic in nature, but Father, at the same time, it has painted a very poignant part of our history, human history. And Father, we can go back in even historic textbooks and look at this and find out that not only biblically were you right, you are historically correct, five for five. And Father, this last part of Daniel in chapter two tells us that there's one thing that has not occurred yet, but Father, we know it's coming. Father, I just pray for that person here today, Father, that doesn't have a relationship with you. Father, that our only hope is found in you. Without you, we are nothing. We will surely be destroyed. Father, today I just pray that that person would come to a real sense through your word. Not through this preaching, but through your word. That, Father, they would realize, Father, a time is coming where I'm going to be I'm going to have to make a decision or it's going to be too late to make one. Father, right now I want to offer myself up to you. I ask that you come into my heart, that you be my God, my Savior. Father, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for the resurrection, Father, that is the freedom from death and hell, Father. And I accept that. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And I believe that there are no other gods before you. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me unconditionally. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for changing my life. Father, help me to turn away from my sin. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. 
Thank you for watching this week's message, and we hope you'll come and give us a look this Sunday. Here you'll find some of the finest country gospel music in the state of Texas, along with good, sound, Bible-based preaching. And I promise, you'll always be greeted with a handshake and a smile. Won't you come join us this Sunday at 10.30 a.m., and we'll have the coffee ready.